So, here you are, in quarantine, looking for a nice cup of coffee. Now, as you leave the house, close to dusk, to avoid the busy streets, you start walking along and notice that none of your favorite spots are open. You're searching high and low, but that one's closed, and that one's closed, and even a uh, coffee party down the street, um, which no one ever goes to, uh, has its doors shut. So what are you to do? Well, you might stroll around looking for an eatery. It turns out that there's one there. High Time serves both lattes and some good apple crumble. And so uh, you're waiting at the counter, and because it's so late, uh, they let you sit down. But the problem is, you take out your computer, and you see this. Now, it's been a while since you've had calc, and you sort of recognize the integral symbol, but you can't, for the life of you, figure out what to do. Well, today's your lucky day, because that's what I'm here to help you with. Okay, so before we get started, there are a couple things that I'm going to expect you to sort of have a familiarity with. It'll make this go a lot faster. So the first thing is integration. Okay, the process of integration, what a definite integral is, uh, and sort of how to calculate basic ones. The idea of substitution and the idea of limits. Okay, number two. A little bit of trig. The only thing you need is the Pythagorean identity uh, and maybe to understand that there are a couple more out there, say the power reducing formula, that make your life a little bit easier. And three, imagination. While we can brute force our way through a lot of the calculation here, it turns out that there are a couple simple rules that will help us make this a walk in the park but perhaps not to a coffee shop. Okay, so the three things I'm gonna talk about that are uh, the bedrock of the solution here, uh, the first being the most important and the other two uh, being kind of important, are the following. Symmetry. Particularly, the symmetry present in even and odd functions. Uh, so we'll do a little quick review of that concept, and we'll discuss why it's so important to making integrals really easy to solve. Two, recognizing common functions. So being able to see when there's something that makes geometric sense or something that makes uh, you know, sense based on your past experience, um, that let you solve more complex integrals really quickly. Um, to identifying these patterns uh, will really help you out. Then three, the last thing, trig substitution and or trig identity. Uh, now, I did say I will presuppose that you know some of these. I'm just gonna go over that uh, really quickly. Trig substitution is maybe a new idea and we won't go into depth with it here, uh, but note, it is very commonly used um, and makes some integrals uh, possible or much easier. Okay, so those are the three things you need. Um, this should be largely solvable at a Calc 2 level, um, but uh, let's break it down. So, the first thing we're going to look at for this problem here is that idea of uh, symmetry. And particularly, uh, what it means to be an even function and what it means to be an odd function. Um, now, uh, these are very particular types of symmetry, uh, and I'm going to give you an example of each one. 
Um, an even function uh, acts very much like even polynomials. Uh, so if you think of an even function, you might think of something uh, like x squared or a constant function, uh, y equals above. We're going to go for functional notation here. f of x is equal to x squared, or f of x is equal to um, 5. Uh, those are examples of even functions. Um, and odd functions, f of x equals x, uh, f of x equals um, sine of x, those are examples of, uh, and I'll put another one here, f of x equals cosine of x. Uh, so these are a few examples of, um, of even and odd functions. Uh, and we're going to break down what that actually means, aside from just looking at some writing and some symbolic notation. Okay, so um, first we're going to look at even functions. So an even function uh, will, on a graph, be symmetrical when folded across the y-axis. So uh, we call this the x, and this is the f of x axis. Uh, so here, I might have a cosine graph. Forgive my uh, drawing. And we can clearly see that this is um, symmetrical, meaning, and here's the key, that f of x is equal to f of negative x. So when I plug in x, or when I plug in negative x, I'll get the same functional value. I'll get the same height above the axis. So if this is, um, you know, some, some point, uh, some x, let's say x equals 3 here, x is over 3, we go up a certain amount, particularly here, probably cosine of 3. Um, then if I plug in x equals negative 3 here, uh, x equals negative 3. At negative 3, I have the same functional value. The f of x level is the same. Okay, and that's what it means to be even. It is perfectly symmetrical across the x or across that y-axis, across that f of x axis. Okay, now let's look at what it means to be an odd function. I'm going to erase these here for just a second. And we're going to look at odd functions. And I'll use a different color for this. Let's go for, let's go for brown. Why not? Well, uh, my x and my f of x, and this is for odd. Uh, I'll write over here. Uh, odd functions um, aren't symmetrical about the x-axis, or about the y-axis, but if we reflect them um, over the x and over the y, uh, we'll get some, some nice symmetry, we'll get some matching up. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, if we say here, uh, let's say we choose that f of x is equal to x, that will look something like this. And what we'll see is that if I choose any x value here, I'll get a particular functional value. And if I choose the negative version of that x value over here, I will get the negative version of that f of x value. And so what we'll end up seeing here is that f of negative x uh, is equal to negative f of x. So if I choose my f of x value, I plug in x, I take that answer, 
And when I say, well, what happens if I get negative x in there? Well, I get negative of that answer. So I'm down below instead of up above, or up above instead of down below. For example, f of x equals negative x, that's also an odd function. Okay, so symmetry about this axis or different types of symmetry about that axis uh, tell us whether a function is even or odd. So the rules here as they stand are f of x equals, uh, f of negative x equals negative f of x. Also, we can say f of negative x negative equals f of x. Uh, that may be useful later. Uh, and here, we have f of x equals f of negative x. So even functions, we can mirror exactly. Odd functions, uh, we'll do a flip and then we'll do a mirror. Okay. Um, so how would I turn this function into an even function? Any guesses? Well, one thing that I can do to turn this into an even function is add some absolute value bars here. And what I get is this function, which is in fact even f of x equals f of negative x. If I go negative x, I get the same value as if I went x. If I plug in x to the function, I get the same answer as negative x, so this becomes just an even function, given I give that those absolute values. Okay, so that's the breakdown of even versus odd. Uh, the important thing to note for even versus odd is this, and this is relating to this particular integral. So I'm gonna get rid of my bars here, and I'm gonna go back to my standard odd function. And uh, the important thing to note is that if I choose some points that are symmetrical, a symmetric interval from here to here, let's say this is five, five, we go five to the right and five to the left, so this point is negative five, and this point is five. And if I were to do that, and I take an integral of this function, what I'll note is that the area here, which is negative, and the area here, which is positive, are actually going to cancel out. So what I end up getting is that for this function in particular, the integral of f of x from negative 5 to 5 dx is 0. And you can see how this would be the case for any odd function. And this is a nice shortcut that's going to save us a ton of time later. Okay. Now, likewise, for the even function, uh, well, one thing that I note here is that if I were to choose, say, this here, this interval, and this interval, let's say, uh, that is um, here, we have pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. Uh, what I'll find if I take the integral of f of x from negative pi over 2, pi over 2, or any non-infinite interval, in this case, uh, there can be issues um, with infinity that are beyond the scope of this video. Um, but I take any, uh, any interval that's symmetric, and what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, um, hmm, this part here is actually equivalent to this part here. And so what I can do is convert this into a new integral from 0 to pi over 2, which can simplify my calculations. Same integral, but over half the range. But I just multiply it by 2 because I have twice as much. 
And so that property of even functions over symmetric intervals is very helpful. Uh, and this property of odd functions over symmetric intervals is really helpful. It cuts out tons of work. Okay, but the problem here is it's really hard to see what this is going to be. Is, is that even? Is that odd? Is that even? Is, you know, so uh, we have to actually come up with a way of figuring out evenness and oddness if we want to properly apply this. Okay, so this is our first look at even and odd. We're going to break down other facets in just a moment. Okay, so we have now looked at even and odd functions, but now let's look at what happens when we multiply them together. Clearly, we have a bunch of functions here uh, that I could consider to, that I'm multiplying together, and uh, it can make my life kind of easy if I do this properly. Okay, so the first thing to notice um, is, let's take some simple functions. Let's take some really nice functions uh, that are really easy to see. Um, let's say f of x equals x. Um, so f of x is an odd function. It's in ground. And we have even functions here. Um, and, and so what I can see is that, okay, f of x is equal to x. So what happens when I multiply it by itself? What happens if I get f of x times f of x? Is that an even function or an odd function? Well, using this example, I can just say, well, that's x times x, which is x squared. Let's call this big F of x. And it's equal to f of x times f of x of x, which is x squared. Uh, and this is even. How do I know? It's a polynomial of even power uh, on its own. Uh, if I were to graph that out, you can see that it's symmetric across the y-axis. Okay, so that's a, one demonstration of odd times odd is even. Okay, uh, but that's not a proof. That's a demonstration with a particular function. Um, now, it's important to note, and something I neglected to mention earlier, that it's not just you choose one point and plug it in. All points have to follow this rule of, remember for odd, odd is f of x, negative f of x equals f of negative x. Uh, so that means for all x. So for all x. For all x, I have that be the case. No, if x is 0, it's true. If x is 17, it's true. If x is 43, it's true. If x is pi over 2, it's true. Uh, this is the condition to be an odd function, but it must be the case for all x. Likewise, the same is true of even functions. Even functions, f of x equals negative f of x for all x. Okay, uh, sometimes we'll put this in front, sometimes in back. It's, uh, it's a logical quantifier, uh, but it's used a lot in math. Okay, so uh, this is the definition of even, this is the definition of odd. So let's use this definition to get some clarity on how we can rigorously look at this as an, a, an even function as a result. 
Well, one thing I can do is say, okay, well, what does it look like to have um, f of negative x? Well, I know that f of negative x uh, should be f of negative x times f of negative x, right? Um, so if f of x is defined as that, f of, when I plug in negative x, I should be getting something that looks like that. Uh, so that's sort of a target to go for. Um, so here, uh, what I can say is based on the definition, well, f of x, if I move this negative over to this side, is the same as saying negative f of negative x by definition up here. And then this again is negative f of negative x. And what do these two negatives do? They cancel out to be a positive. And as we can see, this is the definition of f when we plug in negative x. We're just plugging in negative x to our argument. Um, and so that's a demonstration, and that's, that's saying that if I plug in negative x to x and multiply it by itself, it's the same as plugging in x to f of x and multiplying it by itself. And that is the definition of even. Oh, oops. Definition of even up here is negative change in sign. Uh, negative f of x and f of x are not the same, but f of x and f of negative x are the same. If I change the argument to negative, they are the same. Okay. Um, so this is the definition of even, and so that means that multiplying two odd functions together gets me an even function. So that is a demonstration of that idea. Okay. Now, let's assume I have an uh, uh, and remember, let's call it f of x for uh, just as a reminder, f of x is x. Uh, likewise, let's call g of x uh, let's call g of x, um, let's say g of x is, uh, O, why not, x squared. Okay, so g of x is x squared. So uh, g of x, which is even, as we saw earlier, g of x times g of x, we'll say that that's, big G of x. Uh, and we want to see what the product of this is. Is the product of this even or is it odd? Well, what we're looking for, G of negative x should look like G of negative x times G of negative x. Um, and uh, one way we can do this is we can say, okay, well, I know that G of x is equal to G of negative x by this rule. So this is equal to g of negative x times g of negative x. And uh, what you can see here is this is in fact g of negative x. And so g of negative x is equal to g of x. So this is even. And that means that even times even is even very much the same and very much the, uh, identical to how we calculate uh, even and odd numbers multiply uh, together, or negative and positive numbers multiply together. Okay, now finally, I'm going to keep this idea of g of x being x squared, which is even, and f of x being x, which is odd, and we're going to multiply them together. I'm going to say that h of x, oh, well, let's use a new color. Let's use purple. I like purple. h of x is equal to f of x times, 
g of x. Uh, and what that means is this is an even function times an odd function, or even function times an odd function. Uh, this is equivalent to saying x times x squared, which is equal to x cubed. And as intuition, this is what we should be doing. We can use an example and say, OK, x cubed, what does that look like? Well, x cubed looks like that. Uh, which is symmetric, or well, it's, it's not symmetric, it's in fact an odd function. So we should be expecting this answer to be odd. We flip it over, flip it over again, we say that the f of x here is equal to uh, negative f of negative x, or vice versa, just switch the negative sign somewhere. Okay, so we should be expecting an odd function out of that. And uh, when we multiply these together, um, what we'll see is that uh, we get f of x here is, uh, and I'll change this to a g for now. It doesn't really matter, uh, but just for your own convenience. Um, f of x here is uh, equal to, if I move this negative over to this side, uh, I can rewrite this as negative f of negative x. Um, Likewise, uh, when, I, when I plug in h of negative x, uh, I, I should be getting something that looks, that, uh, well, well, we'll see what that looks like. Okay, so f of negative x times g of x, what's g of x? Uh, well, g of x is the same thing as g of negative x. Um, well, uh, so what do we have here? Well, this right here is h of x, h of negative x. That's h of negative x. Uh, and then we have this negative in front of it. And um, that negative means that h of x equals negative h of negative x, or likewise, negative h of x equals h of negative x, uh, which is, in fact, odd. That means that this function h of x is odd. And so uh, when we take an even times an odd, Um, it's odd, and this is, uh, so uh, this is a nice rule, and it's, it's commutative, I, whether I choose this one to be uh, odd or this one to be odd, that negative stays there uh, regardless. Um, so this rule here ends up being really useful. When we know how we multiply functions together, we can get out of that a uh, very nice way of determining over a symmetric interval if we can get something to go to zero. Okay, now we need to cover two more small things and then we'll get directly into solving this integral. Okay, so the first thing is, the second thing, rather, that we need to figure out uh, and what we want to find in particular is what function Do we recognize? Um, and this may come into play. You don't have. It, it will be a much longer road if we don't use this approach. And I'll start with the long road, and then we'll go and do the short road. Um, but the, it, recognizing functions uh, is really helpful. Uh, and I'm not talking about recognizing what a cosine graph is, uh, although that can be helpful to visualize or what x cubed is, though that can be helpful to visualize. In fact, when we look at this based on what we just talked about, we can see odd function, even function, multiplied together. This should be odd times even is odd. So already we have some odd function there, uh, and maybe that can help us make some 
uh, some progress, uh, although we still have to do a distribution. So we have to figure out what that thing is. What is this thing? Well, is that a function that we recognize? Uh, let's back up for a moment and um, think about what it means um, to be a circle. What does it mean to be a circle? Well, the first thing that it means to be a circle is that centered at the origin, I am an equal distance away from the origin at every point on the circle. The circle is a collection of points that are equal distance from the origin. Should sound familiar. Uh, this should remind you of Pythagorean theorem. Or the distance formula. Uh, in fact, what we know about a circle is that all points, if I consider that point x, y, for all x and all y, uh, they satisfy the condition that they are r away from the center. And uh, if I were to use the distance formula, well, that's based on the Pythagorean theorem and very simple to use if I'm centered at the origin. Uh, the equation here is that x squared plus y squared, the two sides of this triangle here, the x distance plus the y distance squared each is equal to r squared for every point on this circle. That is the definition of the circle. This is a circle centered at the origin, the circle equation. OK. Um, now, what would it look like? What would it look like if I wanted to get the y alone? What would it look like if I wanted to get the y alone uh, if I wanted x to move over, uh, well, what that looks like, if I want a function here, uh, we're going to run into some issues because this is not a function. A circle is not a function. Uh, but what we get is that y squared equals r squared minus x squared. Uh, and uh, one of the things we can do is take the square root of both sides. So I know that y is equal to plus or minus the square root of r squared minus x squared. Um, but for now, let's consider the positive stuff. And what does the positive stuff mean? The positive stuff means I'm only considering what's above that x-axis. And so if I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at just the positive, what I can see is that this looks an awful lot like that, where the radius is 2. So we have a half circle with a radius of 2 that we're multiplying by everything else. And just looking at this, a great thing to notice is that a half circle is an even function. So um, this is up top. Good thing to note. Uh, it may become handy later, but that's not really what I'm looking at here. I'm also looking at this form. Um, in fact, one thing we can also know using a Pythagorean identity the Pythagorean, Pythagorean identity says that um, cosine squared x plus sine squared x is equal to 1. And uh, one of the nice things about this is I can make this look pretty close uh, over here to that. Uh, one thing I can say is, OK, well, what if I want this part alone? I can say that cosine squared x is equal to 1 minus sine squared x. And uh, that cosine of x is equal to the square root of 1 minus sine squared x. And uh, that has an interesting symmetry uh, compared to that. In fact, if I multiply all of this by 4, uh, it may come in handy later. Um, because then, inside, I'll get 4 minus 4 sine x, uh, sine squared x, and that's really close to what we have up there. Um, so that's a taste of how we're going to approach uh, solving that problem.
Another thing we might need to know for the future, and I'm going to write this up here, is that cosine squared x is equal to 1 plus cosine of 2x over 2. And this is a power-reducing formula uh, that will come in handy a little bit later when we're doing a bigger integration. Okay, uh, so the idea, the, the, so w what functions do we recognize? Well, we recognize a circle, and that can solve a lot of problems, just noticing that. Uh, another thing that you can notice is that it reminds you of the Pythagorean theorem, which, you know, is related to Pythag Pythagorean identity, particularly when we're talking about circles. Um, and uh, when I notice this, I can say, hey, there might be a reason to do a substitution later uh, in the case that I get something that looks like cosine or that I'm looking for something that looks like cosine um, or that I'm looking to integrate some really weird function like that uh, where replacing something with sine squared or with sine or with uh, not with sine squared but with sine or with secant or with cotangent or something like that can actually simplify the problem significantly. Um, and so that's a further form of substitution, uh, not directly u substitution, but trigonometric substitution that I'm not going to go heavy into detail with because this video is already long enough, uh, but um, will still be helpful for us along the way. Okay. Now, we're about ready to solve the problem. We have some tools. that allow us to produce the Wi-Fi path. Okay, so at this point we've made a determination of the oddness and evenness of various parts of this function. Um, so at this point what we're going to do is we're going to break this apart after distributing uh, so that we can look at it more clearly. Okay, so I'm going to use purple for this whole process. Very nice color. Uh, props to Murphy. Okay, so what we have here is uh, an integral that looks like negative 2 to 2 of x to the third cosine, so we're distributing to there and to there, cosine x over 2 root 4 minus x squared plus root 4 minus x squared over 2 times that. Okay, uh, and if I split this up, um, really what I should be doing here is take this as an integral and this as an integral And let's uh, first evaluate this one on the left. So this is where even and odd comes in. I have a symmetric interval. I have an odd function multiplied by an even function, which is odd. So this whole thing here is odd, integrated from negative 2 to 2 with a definite integral. And that means It's all zero. The left side and the right, the left side of the axis and the right side of the axis, they'll cancel each other out. One side will be negative, the other side will be positive, uh, and it will, or zero on both, and uh, we'll get a zero value, which means that this entire thing is equal to this thing only. So we've automatically cut out the problem to be something very simple, relatively. Okay. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to evaluate this integral. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is say it's from negative 2 to 2, and I'm going to pull out that 1 half, and I'm going to say root 4 minus x squared. And uh, one of the things that's really nice is, well, we know this is even. 
and it's over a symmetric interval. And so what we can do is, uh, I'll leave this here and write it on the next line. Uh, that's equivalent to uh, one over two times two of these. Okay, so I have two of those and I have one half of them. And so those will cancel out. And so I'm just left with this little baby integral there. Um, now, this is where we're going to take the integration seriously and actually do some process. Uh, and this process is entirely unnecessary if you have a geometric uh, observation. But let's pretend we're just going to bull rush through because uh, we want to get on this Wi-Fi um, and then we want to enjoy our uh, delicate snacks. Okay. So, how do I approach this? Well, it would require, it is something that would require uh, some sort of chain rule undoing. And we know the way to undo the chain rule is with u substitution. Uh, but we don't have um, something pretty here uh, to do that with. We don't have some x to replace this with. If we say like x squared or 4 minus x squared is u, um, well, where does that leave us? It means that we have uh, negative 2x to replace, 2x dx, but we don't see one of those uh, to be du. Um, so we're missing something here. Uh, I mean, certainly we can, we can try to evaluate it, um, but what, what we are going to actually do here, uh, one thing we're going to actually try out, is a different type of substitution um, called trig substitution. And we're going to substitute as such. And it is, you know, it, it's, it's a more complicated substitution than we've seen before. We're actually going to substitute in for x a more complicated expression uh, that will lead us to a reduced difficulty down the line. Okay. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to say that um, based on our observation earlier that the uh, Pythagorean uh, identity uh, cosine squared x is equal to 1 minus sine squared x. Uh, based on this identity, if I multiply the whole thing by 4, I get 4 cosine squared x equals 4 minus 4 sine squared x. Taking the square root, I get 2 cosine squared x, or cosine x rather, is equal to uh, root 4 minus 4 sine squared x. Um, and this looks very similar to what we have up here. And in fact, if we say that what x really is, if we say that x is equal to 2 sine of x, if we make the substitution and just suppose, and not 2 sine of x, let's say 2 sine of theta, uh, x is 2 sine of theta. We're going to switch our variable up. We're, we're making a substitution. We're making a transformation. We're transforming this problem into a different space, into polar coordinates, and we are then evaluating it. Okay, so what are we going to do here? We're going to say, okay, well, 2 sine of theta is going to be x, so what is dx? What should I replace dx with in this new transformed system? Uh, well, we take the derivative and we see that it's 2 cosine of theta. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to plug these into our original problem after we figure out how to replace the bounds of integration. So if I plug, so one, one way of looking at this is we're going to look at the bounds. So the bounds of integration uh, require us to have something we're trying to figure out what theta is, because theta is our new variable. Oh, new theta. Forgot about that. We're integrating with respect to theta, so we need theta to be, have values that we span. And so 
uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, isolate theta here because that's really easy. Um, so I'm going to divide by 2 and take the inverse sine. So we know that the inverse sine of x over 2 is equal to theta. We're just doing some algebra and isolating theta. Now, let's say what happens at x equals 0. It's sine inverse of 0. 0 fits the bill. So we can say that uh, theta is equal to 0 for our lower bound. Uh, likewise, at x equals 2, I plug in 2 here, I get sine inverse of 2 over 2, sine inverse of 1. Well, pi over 2 fits the bill there. And we only want to go really for one, uh, one period, if possible, or half period. Uh, and so what we're going to look at here is um, that uh, at, well, in this case, first period, um, uh, theta is pi over 2 at x of 2. Um, so we have this transformed function. Uh, we have some new bounds. And so erase this, and let's get to solving. OK. So I have my bounds, I have my substitution, I have my integral, let's go. So I get the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of square root of 4 minus 2 sine of theta squared times what I'm replacing dx with. 2 cosine of theta d theta. And so what I've done here is I'm saying, OK, well, hmm, let's pull this 2 out, and let's multiply this up, and we'll see what we can find. So we get 2, 0 to pi over 2, square root of 4 minus squared squared or sine squared of theta. Hey, that's familiar. That's something we've seen before. Times cosine of theta d theta. But this, we've already seen, by is equal to uh, 4 cosine of squared theta. And this is equal to 2 cosine of theta. And if I fill this out, uh, I can pull this 2 out, and then I have a cosine uh, squared term in, in the integral. And so I get 4, 0 to pi over 2 of cosine squared theta d theta. And this is where we would take our identity, plug it in, and solve relatively easily. And I'm going to do that over there, uh, but I just want to give you a bit of preamble. After I solve this, we're going to figure out the answer, and then we're going to do the short version. Note I've already changed the bounds, so there's nothing else I have to do. With this integral, our transformation is complete. And all I have to do is find a number, uh, which is the boring part. OK, so let's do this substitution. So I see that I have 4 from 0 to pi over 2 of 1 plus cosine of 2 theta over 2 d theta. Pull this 2 out. And I get 2, integral of 0 to pi over 2, of 1 d theta, if I separate this as well, plus integral from 0 to pi over 2 of cosine of 2 theta d theta. This right here is just theta 
if we theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2, which is just pi over 2. And then this is uh, 1 half of sine of 2 theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 2. Plug in pi over 2, I get pi. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 0 is 0. This entire thing is 0 now. So I only care about this part. This part, which I said, is equal to pi over 2. Pi over 2 minus 0. Uh, so pi over 2 times 2 and pi over 2 times 2 is pi, which is the answer. Well, it's not the Wi-Fi password, but you can figure that one out on your own. Okay, I'll help. Okay, I believe that is correct. Ten digits of pi, uh, that is our solution. That seems like a lot of work to go through, and most of it came from evaluating this integral. Why would I try to evaluate that integral when I can just find the answer with intuition? Let's rewind and restart. So this integral up here is equal to just this. Okay, well, let's simplify this slightly and try to figure it out. There are two ways we can do it. I'll show both of them, uh, and it should be a piece of cake. Or, well, pie. Okay, so what we get is 2, 1 half, rather, of the integral from uh, negative 2 to 2 of root 4 minus x squared dx. Now remember, uh, the Riemann integral tells us the area under the curve here. And uh, what we can do is look at this function and make and have a, have a nice intuition. Uh, this is a function where the radius is 2. And uh, we're taking, in effect, the area of this slice. Now, the area of this, just by intuition, well, what's the area of, of a circle of radius 2? It's pi times 2 squared which is 4 pi. But we don't want 4 pi, we want half of that, half of the circle. Or if you were to just consider the symmetric interval, we'd want a, or the, the, uh, the positive part of the interval, we'd only want a quarter of that, meaning just pi. Uh, but we'll, we'll worry about this here. So actually, we want this here isn't 4 pi, it's only this part above the axis, this is 2 pi. And we take 1 half times 2 pi, and we get pi. So we went from eliminating this almost immediately, making it 0, to realizing that this is just describing the area of half of half of a circle of radius 2. So we didn't have to do any integral calculation at all. We just had to use a geometric observation. Uh, this problem really is very pretty because it shows the power of symmetry and observation to make complex looking problems or even complicated problems much easier. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Now you can sit down, maintain your six foot radius and enjoy your pie.